Hello and welcome to Africa Today. I am Busolami Tunwashe. From poor leadership to failing economies, Africa is seen as a continent where weak institutions are largely responsible for sustaining poverty, obstructing development, and ensuring exclusion at all levels. At a time when the continent continues to play catch up with the rest of the world, privatization has grown to become a template adopted to make up a profound infrastructural deficit where nearly 600 million people lack access to electricity and about 30, 300 million have no access to potable water. So we ask, what are your thoughts on the prospects and shortcomings of public-private partnerships and solutions across Africa, especially in Nigeria? You can join the conversation and share your thought with us on Twitter at TVC News NG. We'll take a report on Africa today and the show will start proper. Welcome on board. Traditionally, there is a school of thought that believes government's major obligation is the provision of infrastructure. But that ideology began to change in recent years with the adoption of public-private partnerships to cover up for infrastructural deficits as a result of increasing population, reduction in payments of taxes, social pressure, poor maintenance culture, corruption, amongst others. Recently, Delegates drawn from among civil society and labor unions from Ghana, Rwanda, and Kenya met in Lagos, Nigeria to reveal the effects of privatization in all its forms and its impact on communities, workers, and general public. This is about the PPP, uh, the ills of the PPP, the objectives of the PPP, and the failings you know, of uh, the PPP and privatization in general. The reality, you know, is that um, without this kind of workshop, a lot of people will remain in the dark about what is going on. Certain basic issues that they should be asking themselves about governance and the inability of government to deliver, especially across the African continent and so on, are in a way tied to the uh, basic issues of discussion. Participants also analyze policy options to strengthen democratic control of sectors slated for corporate takeovers such as public water, energy, education, and housing. It is believed that in fashioning solutions to public sector challenges, governments across the continent have ignored critical voices of women, the youth, and other critical voices in the society. Glad to have you back. According to statistics, 37 countries in sub-Saharan Africa jointly raised more than $11 billion through various privatization programs between 2010 and 2015. But critics of the economic model are quick to point out how the system is corrupt and why processes are complex amidst the failure of government to act as a strong regulator and make it count for the people. Joining me on, in the studio rather today is I uh, have Akimbo De Olua Femi, Deputy Executive Director, Environmental Rights Action. I also have Baba Aye of Health and Social Sector Officer of Public Services International. And on Skype, I have Saida Nafisi, Senior Program Director, Corporate Accountability, United States. Many thanks for joining me, gentlemen and lady. <laughs> All right, let's kick the ball rolling. I will start with you, Babaye. Uh, Nigeria is ranked 152 in terms of development index. That's the UNDP report uh, that we have. And you had a figure I reeled out earlier about uh, 3 million deficit in terms of access to water, uh, in, in terms of uh, access to electricity. And in Nigeria, particularly, we have about 17 million housing deficit. Can you underscore the importance of development for us? Development is something that the government has a responsibility to meet up with. And uh, you really cannot overemphasize the need of that uh, in Nigeria. Um, the right to health, the right to housing, uh, the right to water. Uh, you find the bulk of Nigerians not uh, being able to benefit of this fundamental human rights. Uh, uh, however, I think one thing that is important to point out is that um, the myth of how to address this, because every government actually um, has to claim to want to bring about development to legitimize its rule. But the question is how? And tied to that question of how 
his why. How did we get to this impasse? This is the same Nigeria where you did not have this extent of deficits in the First Republic up to 79, earlier part of the Second Republic. So what happened? And I must say that what happened is closely tied to the neoliberal counter-revolution that rolled back the gains of what was limited as they might be, but quite significant of what was the developmental state model that was adopted at the earlier point of independence and which played a key role in providing housing, Jack on the housing, for example, right. in providing education, health, and so on and so forth for the bulk of Nigeria. Okay, but do, you, do you agree with him in terms of uh, the importance of development? And if you can, if you can tell us the difference between what government calls development and what the masses call development. I think I, I, like, I like the point you make about what the masses call, call development. I think the basic thing the masses are looking for are what you said, you know, housing, education, health, you know, water, and all those things that are really essential, you know, to our living, to life, and we, we call them the basic human rights, you know, for living. And they are so essential that some of them are very critical that we cannot do without, without them. You see, you can't do without water for like seven days. And any government that comes must be seen to be moving towards that side. And the, the most worrisome trend is the strategy or the method that is being adopted by current governments in getting to that destination. And we begin to see that most of those agendas are serving the elites, the corporations, rather than the people whom you've asked about. You begin to see mega projects where the people are mega poor. And that's what we need to address. Okay, uh, Saida, over to you now. Let's talk a bit of economics here, if you will. The consumer uh, price index in Nigeria, of course, which is how we calculate our inflation rate here, talks about the price of goods and the price of services. If you will, can you please tell us how this can affect the pockets of the ordinary people? Yes, absolutely. You've come to a critical issue because water really is a daily bread and butter issue for people across the globe. I can speak from our experience working on water issues across the globe, where really, you know, a good water system will ensure access to clean drinking water that's affordable for every single person, regardless of their ability to pay. Precisely because bread and butter, you know, pocket issues are essential to people across the globe. And what we find is that water privatization across the globe has led to uh, failure in that regard. And um, one of the critical reasons is that governments have a legal obligation to the human right to water. Whereas corporations have a legal obligation to maximize profits for their shareholders. And so what you see, whether it's Pittsburgh, United States, or Jakarta, Indonesia, or Nagpur, India, is that water privatization leads to communities that can't afford a premium, can't afford to pay a premium, getting cut off. It leads to labor downsizing, labor abuses. It leads to lack of infrastructure investment. It leads to lo loss of democratic control, and in some cases, actually, to governments uh, being sued by corporations for trying to protect their people and ensure that water remain affordable. All right, we've set the foundation, really, the importance of development. And uh, we're situ situating it now in Nigeria in terms of uh, the regulatory agencies that we have in Nigeria to handle uh, infrastructure. We have the Infrastructure Conce Concession Regulatory Commission, which we have the Act of 2005. You have the Public Enterprises Act of 1999. You're aware that these entities exist. But how would you score them? Yes, I'll, I'll score them an abysmal look. And then you begin to ask me why. You see, basically what you need to look at are what are you know, those institutions, those infrastructures that have been privatized. What has been their performance record? You know, are they in any way better than the way they were before? In fact, is that you also look at whether sincerely government was able to actually generate revenue or make money out of all this. What you've seen is almost like a scam syndicate where a set of people sit down together 
you know, get our common weight and allocate them, appropriate them to their cronies and to their friends in some cases. Some critical sectors, it's been found out that, look, some directors, people who actually are those regulatory agencies, eventually becomes beneficiary of the so-called privatization process. Look, look at the privatization of the electricity sector in Nigeria. We know how the, it, it looks like another Beijing conference. They basically share Nigeria between the current generals and the old generals and the leading politicians of today. I mean, how? What was their experience? What's their expertise? Right. How much have they brought into, you know, the electricity process? How much? But they are, I'm going to put you on hold right now. We'll go on a short break. At today, Africa Today, of course, we'll be looking at the prospect and shortcomings of public-private partnerships and solutions across Africa, especially here in Nigeria. We'll go on a short break and return with more on the show. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Politically, the notion of public-private partnership has been touted as a magic economic formula that will minimize the problems of outright privatization while maximizing the benefits to society. But the experience in Africa shows that PPPs now suffer many of the ills that afflict both privatization and public tendering. My guess is very much around in the studio. I have two of them, two wonderful gentlemen. Babaye is here and uh, Bode is here. And I have uh, Saida over there in the United States via Skype. But uh, you were making a point just before we went on that short break. Yeah, I was just basically saying that those so-called regulatory agencies have not performed their role very well because when you actually study the origin of what we're dealing with here, privatization and PPP, uh, because they are basically exactly the same. Yeah. They were actually, you know, neoliberal policies that were actually not designed to serve the people. And so there is no way they can actually serve the interest of the people. And the examples are bound, even in Nigeria. And I won't want to begin to mention or list them here. We're, we're going to try show. and touch on some of those uh, projects, some of those uh, maybe entities that have been privatized, concession, or leased yeah. out, if we can, on the program. But let's go to you, to you now and let's talk about the challenges. Private sector most of the time complained of lack of transparency or s sometimes a, a lack of commitment on the part of the government. What do you have to say to that? I think the problem is much more complex than that. Um, you know, there's this Yoruba saying that when someone with K leg is carrying tree and you are saying the tree is bent, the person asks you to look down and mm. not just up. All right. It is a myth to think that it's, it's, it's a problem of implementation or something limited to Nigeria when you talk of PPPs. PPPs, as a rule, are a fraudulent means of subsidizing profit making by the few rich at the cost of the state's resources that should otherwise be utilized for the benefit of the masses. And even so those so that you are not, not pro-PPP, is that what you're saying? It's, it's not about being pro-PPP. I am pointing out what the evidence shows. Okay. And which Public Services International has time and again pointed out to officials of the IMF, officials of the World Bank, and what they say is, well, maybe out of 80% of the times PPPs have not worked, but at, we still think they are the right thing, and that does not make sense. Look at what happened with Carillon in the UK recently. Before that, the Jubilee Network, Jubilee 2000, published a material which I would want you and anyone interested in PPP to read on double standards, where the British government has realized the failings of PPPs in the United Kingdom, but yet they are pushing it to Africa. Just last month, the ECA, the European Council of Arbitrators, pointed out that PPPs are not useful for you. Let me tell you one little thing. All right. Very little, but very important. Why people will have illusions in the billions of uh, dollars that are being gained right now. Yeah. It takes decades before the failures of PPPs fully manifest. PPP started under Margaret Thatcher in Britain as PFIs, public finance initiatives. And it wasn't until the 2000s it became very clear, even to, to, to the, most other, the most faithful defenders of it. All right. you know? So PPPs, because governments can, when you talk of PPPs, most of these private entrepreneurs, 
they use the government as guarantors, like Visionscape in, in Lagos, for example, to draw billions, up to at times eight billion there okay. from let, banks. Let's go, they, let's go. They hardly ever bring let's go to Shay Seida much, now. Much, much money. Let's, let's have much, the experience it's, it's of, of the United States. Seida, are you there? You've been listening to the discussion, really. Uh, what PPP means to us here in Nigeria and, of course, uh, the experience of the UK. Babaye was just sharing that with us. Can you share with us the experience uh, in, in the US? Absolutely. So much of what Babaye has mentioned, we've also experienced here in the US. Uh, time and time again, these so-called public-private partnership projects, which are really privatization by another name, have failed in our own backyard. Uh, I mentioned the case in Pittsburgh earlier. There have been numerous contracts um, in, in other cities. Uh, in the case of Pittsburgh, for example, there's currently an ongoing lead crisis. Um, there are a number of, uh, a litany of abuses that we see with these types of, of privatization projects. Um, and, and for that very reason, there are communities who've mobilized in many different cities to oppose private water contracts uh, in Baltimore, in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, there's a growing wave of these kinds of projects, uh, of these kinds of, uh, of, of groups that are mobilizing to take back control of, of public water actually across the globe. Uh, so just in the past couple of decades, there have been over 200 cities that have mobilized to take back control of their municipal water systems. Um, because of all of these abuses. Okay, but I'm going to stay with you now. If they take back the control, do they have the money to run those enterprises? Because that's actually the bane here. The government says, okay, I'm broke. I cannot do this. I cannot foot the bills all by myself. Yes, you raise a very, very critical point, and I'm so glad that you did, because as you say, many governments decide to privatize because they believe that they're going to get the money that they need to run the system. And that's because the World Bank and global corporations for decades have been promoting that ideology. But it's really, it's a false, uh, it's a false notion. Uh, the truth is, if you look at the history of privatization cases, uh, and you even look at the research of the World Bank itself, you can see that private corporations have failed to provide the infrastructure investment needed to ensure universal access. Um, there are a number of quotes that we could pull forward from global um, uh, corporate leaders that talk about how uh, corporations aren't banks, how it's the responsibility of governments to provide the investment. So really, you, you're having what, we, what I would call a bait and switch uh, situation where corporations are selling their wares with one premise, saying that they're going to get the money to governments. And in fact, that's not what they're doing in practice. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll get back to you. Akimbode, let's go through some of the projects that we have in Nigeria. Let's start with the airport. I mean, basically, what if we, if we started by, you know, the language of concession, you know, how many of those things that we've concessioned have worked very well? And the most famous one is actually the city where we are in that, you know, we had the lucky concessioning, and ultimately the government had to buy back the debt. And when the government buys back the bed, it's those, I mean, it, it was paid by the taxpayers' money, by you and I. I mean, there is a, I, I don't want to call it a scandal, you know, before our very face, the vision scape issue currently and brings stay, stay with that, like, a bit, if, if you will. What, the reasons that, okay, the levy no, they, on, they, on, on they the ordinary citizen was becoming too high. Was that, was that the mean, reason? look, they had a contract to recoup their money over 25 years. Mark my word, when you do a PPP contract, even if you kick them out today, they're still going to get their money back. In fact, Viola oh, just put up a report where, mm -hmm. they, where they says water is money. So they don't think about you and I. They think Everything about is profit. commodity. It's and a see, commodity. Look, it's actually a myth to think that corporations are bringing in this money. No, they bring in their laptop and these PowerPoints and come and present it to our government and other <laughs> things that they do in the other room. And then they will then claim that the government should give them the guarantee to go to the banks. So you they don't use want the government. You don't want to go to the power sector, really, in terms of loan. Oh, remember? absolutely. <laughs> no, look at the power like sector. Scope, they, scope, they scope. Can't, they, do you know what scandal we just discovered now? One of the companies in the north is actually begging government to come and buy them back. And you're going to see this. And so you see a vicious circle where we are deceived as a people, 
and then we also then they fail, then they sack them, but the government pays them. Is a scam in Gab in Gabon? They just throw away viola. This is taking the government to court. They are going to recoup that money. And Flint, it happened. They taking the government to court to, for services they don't render. We've read this. I mean, about a month ago, here in Lagos, if they clear the garbage or not, they get over 700 million into their account every month, and that is going to be for a period of 10 years, 85 billion, for a loan of 50 billion that was guaranteed by the states. Come on, we've got to sit down as a people and say, this is over, let us, they talk about getting the money. It's easy for government to even borrow from banks at very low rates to finance those infrastructure. And if you're sure they will pay back. And of course, you know, the gov they again go back to the banks with the guarantees that they get from the government. So who is deceiving who here? So we have a multitude of these sectors that have really failed us. And we are saying the critical sectors, health, okay. education, you know, housing should right. be left out of but, but yeah, let, let me quickly come to you now. What, in your own opinion, is the way forward? I, I think this idea of um, that uh, PPPs and privatization in general are supposedly necessary um, due to government not having enough funds is, is, is bunkum, really. I mean, uh, because it's about priorities. The same governments. We are senators get starting point five million naira each every month. The same government where we keep hearing of sixteen billion on um, um, power. We don't. Say. It's it's about power. It is. It's about stopping corruption. It's about domestic resource mobilization, which could also be achieved with tax justice. It's about putting people over profit. It's about community mobilization. So what you're saying, in essence, if this leakage is blocked, no, government not, is not rich not enough to finance. Leakages, yes. It's about leakages. It's also about power. It is not just an economic question. It is a political question. Because this is what Warren Buffett, one of the eight billionaires that own as much wealth as half of the world, when he said, there's a class war, quite all right, and we are winning. What did he mean that we are winning? What he meant was that their ideological hegemony with which things like privatization and PPP are pushed through have been taken all hook, right. line, and sinker. And this is what we must challenge, that there's the money there. It is about the priorities that are given by those that are supposed to be our representatives. Okay, let's, let's quickly go to Saida right now and we'll let her go. Saida, your last word on, on, on this matter. Babaye feels otherwise. Uh, government can do this. You, you, you alluded to that already. Uh, what's your final words on this? I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, if you look at how corporations manage water systems, uh, this spe speaks to the point that we made earlier about how the fact that corporations are not actually bringing the investment to the table that's needed. The way that they recoup their investment is either from governments and government subsidies, or it's from individuals. It fr it's from ratepayers. Um, and there's no reason why we as societies can't collectively pool our resources and invest in a public water system that provides water for all. In fact, that's the only way that it's really been done successfully, is that um, we decide as, as, a, as a people, um, as peoples across the globe, that it's important to us that every single person has access to clean drinking water, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do from a public health perspective. It's the right thing to do from a development perspective. And in fact, it's the way that it's been done and works. Okay. So we as a society need to decide to invest in that, and that's the only way that we'll ensure that everybody has access to it. All right, Saida Nasifi, Senior Program Director, Corporate Accountability, United States. Many thanks for your time and contributions in Africa today. You heard what she said. Thank you we're, so much We're for wrapping up me. really right now, but we don't even have such uh, the water privatization or the PPP yet in the water corporation. So that's another, another topic for another. It's in the works. It's another and topic from for another. From 2014, we've been fighting that in Lagos. All right. And we've actually produced a document to show them what ought, what to, ought to be done by okay. the Lagos State Government. Right. Perhaps but we'll take a part two of this and, and, and look at that. All right. Many thanks for your time Thank on you Africa much. today, right. gentlemen. Bye. Bye. Babaye is of the Babaye is of the Health and Social Sector Officer of Public Services International and Akimbadi Oluwafemi, Deputy Executive Director, Environmental Rights Action.
Home to some of the most promising nations of the world, Africa readily tops the list of nations where stability looks more like a mirage and sustainable development is probably an, a mannequin challenge between public innovation and private intervention reaching for greater height will require a paradigm shift, policy upgrade, and the political will to commit more resources in closing the gap between demand and delivery. That's our package for today, but don't forget to join the conversation on Twitter at TVC News NG and also follow me for updates around Africa at Busi Solami TVC News. Until next time, I am Busolami Tumashi, but always remember, Africa can only get better. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.